I'm here in the Tachikawa Velodrome, which is on the outskirts of Tokyo. It's about a 50 minute train ride away. We've just arrived here and we're looking forward to seeing what the Japanese care in racing is all about. I'm really looking forward to this one. So whilst walking here to the velodrome from the train station, I was amazed at actually how quiet it appeared around the velodrome. Because if you go to any big sporting event in the UK, generally you know you're in the right place because of the noise and the people and such like involved. But here, it was actually quite eerily quiet to be perfectly honest. And I did have to keep checking my phone to make sure we were in fact in the right place. We were in the right place. But something that has really struck me is inside of the velodrome too it is incredibly quiet. There's really not that many people here, despite the fact that the entrance fee is just 50 yen, which is about 40 cents if you're in the US, probably about 40 cents if you're in Europe, and probably about 40p if you're in the UK, for instance. So why aren't more people here? Well, this sport is absolutely massive in Japan. It is, in fact, one of the four sports that you can bet on legally. The other sports being horse racing, another one is motorcycle racing, and the other one, believe it or not, is powerboat racing. So Karen was actually introduced back in 1948 as a way for the government to make some money from the taxes involved with gambling. And it's been said that each year, the revenue generated from Karen racing is actually 1.3 trillion yen, which I can't work out in my head, but it is certainly a lot. Anything that involves a trillion is certainly a great deal of money, let's face it. So why aren't these races absolutely packed full of people? Because it's so cheap to get in, let's face it. Well, for a start, it's 11 a.m. on a Wednesday, so most people are actually at work. So most of the spectators here today are elderly gentlemen who are likely to be retired and simply want to have a day out watching some great bike racing. You can also, though, bet online from the comfort of your own home, and there is, in fact, pay-per-view TV stations enabling you to watch each and every single race. And with 50 velodromes across the country, as well as about 3,000 professional caring athletes, that's a lot of racing you can catch up on. Now, today is just an average day for a caring rider, so it's nothing special. There's no championship to be won or anything like that. Now, up until recently, I always thought to myself, why don't these specialists in care in racing head on over to Europe where they could make some money? But in actual fact, in Europe, you can't make any money out of it. Instead, here in Japan, the top athletes can actually earn up to $2 million per year. Yeah, that's right. So it's the kind of equivalent of a premiership soccer player in the UK. They make their money from their club, not their country. Hence the reason why they really do like to play for their club rather than their country, although there is some certain prestige to represent your country. Now, in order to actually try and get a younger crowd in, they've actually introduced women's Kirin racing again. It used to be in operation from 1949 until 1964. That went to the wayside though, and then back in 2012, it was reintroduced. And the timing of those races too, in order to get a younger crowd in. So after they finish work, so about half past five, six o'clock, that's when those races take place. So what exactly is a Japanese care-in race then? Because many of you will know the more popular Olympic discipline where we use a motorbike, in effect, to pace the riders around. It's actually called derny and it's pedal assisted. Here in Japan, how is it ran then? Well, for a start, you don't have that motorized derny. Instead, you have a rider who does the pacing for you. And they start off at 16 miles an hour, roughly, and build up to about 30 miles per hour. The race itself lasts approximately two kilometers. So on this track behind me, which is 400 meters, that's five laps. But what about the riders? What are they all about? And how many of them are there? Well, here, you're gonna have nine sprinters lined up on the track at any one time. But that can vary. Sometimes you have six riders. And essentially, they cannot pass that pace rider at the front up until one and a half laps to go. Once that pace rider swings off, the riders they become pretty physical with one another. And even behind the pacer, things can get a little bit tense at times. You see elbows and shoulders and heads being thrown in the direction of other riders. And underneath those colorful costumes they've got on, they do in fact have body armor too, because the Japanese care in style of racing is totally different to what we see in UCI sanctioned events. 
Uh, here, for instance, they can essentially undertake, overtake whenever they like, and it's not uncommon to even see riders slightly deviate underneath the bottom line of the track there too. It's all part of the culture of this style of racing. So behind me on the track there, you can see the start gates. So again, if we compare it to the care in racing you may well have seen where riders are held up by essentially their coach or their manager, here, that's controlled by compressed gas. So all riders definitely have to start at the same time. Otherwise, well, they're gonna to fall to the wayside. Now that's about 25 meters away from the actual start line of the, of the event. So riders, they generally fall into line. But how do they know then where to actually line up in that racking system? Well, they pick a number from a hat to make it even and fair for all riders involved. Now, a typical caring race actually takes place over three days inside of the velodrome. And each rider they get to race time and time again against riders of a different caliber, depending of course on their finishing positions and their ranking points, because that's what it's all about. The more ranking points you've got, the more money you can make. Now, Jessie J, some of you may know, she sang a song, it's not all about the money. But in caring racing, I'm rapidly learning it is all about the money, both for the riders as well as the association and also the government, because that's where they make a lot of money from the revenue of it. So this is where all the action's actually happening. Trackside, there's hardly anybody out there, but inside of here, there are hundreds of guys betting on the racing. And this gentleman over my shoulder here, he actually just told me I had a nice face, and I'm hoping he likes me, because if I'm really clever or careful with this, it could well work in my favor, because all of these things there, all the the details on the board. He's like a fortune teller. That's the easiest way I could explain this, really. So he has insider information, or at least he thinks he does, and you can pay him for that advice so that you can fill in one of these, one of these betting slips, and then go ahead and place your bet. That's crazy. I've never heard of anyone doing that at a sports event, but he said he likes me. He said I had a nice face, so maybe he'll give me some good tips. Or maybe not. Maybe it was just a trick. So just behind me on the screen there, it's actually a live stream from another caring race which is taking place about 500k away. And um, well, they're slowly departing after having watched the race, probably to either go and collect their winnings or maybe go and put a bet on for someone else. But uh, it is really interesting how they seem to really study the form here. It's just like horse racing back in the UK. And if your luck is really not going your way, why not get yourself a good drink for good luck at this vending machine? It's even got branding on it from the Japanese Professional Cyclist Union. And get this, a little TV screen on there too, so you don't miss any of your favorite action whilst your drink's being prepared. So just like any sporting event, there's heaps of different food vendors here, so you can go and get something to, well, maybe celebrate a victory, or in my case, drown away your sorrows, because there's a sign over there saying pizza and beer, that sounds quite appealing. But also, one of the great things about this is that for a non-Japanese speaker, like myself, I can actually pick a little plastic card from the side of the restaurant and actually just hand it to the person behind the till. So in my case, I kind of know what I'm going to be getting because there's even a handy photograph on that too. So yeah, I'm staying quite safe with that. Check this light out behind me. This is where all of the bikes are kept for each and every caring rider here. Now, if you notice, there's no carbon in sight, is there? Not one bit of carbon fibre because, in fact, all riders have to use NJS stamped approved material. NJS is the kind of Japanese caring association when it comes to approval of parts. Hence why the use of steel frames is heavily in use. And they come at a pretty good price too. When I say pretty good, I mean pretty hefty, in fact, because they have to meet stringent controls. Not just the frames, the wheels, the spokes, the tyres, the hubs, every little bit of component on the bike, even down to the grips and saddle, have to have an NJS stamp on it. That is what I find absolutely amazing. All competitors are actually on a truly level playing field. Nobody has an advantage or disadvantage by having a different bike. Okay, yes, frame builders can vary in quality and such like, but ultimately they all have to meet the same safety standards or same approvals in this case of the NJS stamp. NJS, that normally adds on a pretty, pretty good premium, let's say, onto the price tag, and it's traditionally Japanese brands who actually deal with it. Campagnolo in the past, they did make a Pista group set that had the NJS stamp on it, but that's one of the few non-Japanese brands that ever break into the scene, if you like. 
Let's talk about the wheels then, shall we? Well, every rider, in fact, uses exactly the same rim type. In the case here, it is the Araya Gold Tubular Rim, MJS stamped, of course. And then in most cases too, they're mounted onto a pair of Shimano Dura Ace, MJS stamped, don't forget, large flange hubs. And then the tires, they actually come from a brand called Soyo, and they come with a different valve to normal. So usually we see tubular tires where they press the valve, but these actually come with a valve which looks like an old wood type valve. So slightly more oversized and does require a different pump head to actually get it to inflate. Sticking with the wheels, check out that as well. The actual spokes, they're tied and soldered just to give them an extra little bit of strength there so they're not gonna flex around at all. And then something which I think is super interesting too is that the tires actually have a stamp on it for each and every race, I'm led to believe, in order to actually maintain their lifespan so you're not using old tires that have been glued on there for a long time and such like. And I have also heard too that if you make contact with another rider during a pairing event, then in fact, you have to replace that tire. And that comes at quite a hefty price tag too, because they're about 70 pounds, so that's 70 dollars, 70 euros, I guess, these days. I'm not sure what goes on with the currency rates, but yeah, that could end up costing you a fair bit of money, I suppose, if you're a rough and tough type of rider. And when it comes to frames, well, there's probably about 40 to 50 NJS approved builders in Japan, which is quite a lot, isn't it? It's good to see that the custom frame builder game is still around. I am led to believe as well that there is a couple of companies, I think it's Bridgestone and Anchor, who actually make carbon fiber NJS approved bikes. However, I've not seen one of them here yet, and I don't reckon there is one either. Karen is so rich and deep in tradition, that I don't think any rider dare break the mold, if you like. The exception though, that comes from the females who are racing Karen because they are allowed to use carbon fiber bikes as well as carbon fiber wheels and they don't have to have the NJS approved stamp on them as far as I'm aware. But just looking at the bikes here, you could easily be confused that each and every one of them is the same because like I've already said, essentially they are. It's just the builder of the frame and also the paintwork. But I could look at them all day because there's something great about just the simplicity of a track bike. So just behind me there is where the riders hang out. And when I say hang out, I mean they're actually in there for six days because remember the event itself is three days, plus prior to that, three days before the event itself, the riders are actually put in there and don't have any contact at all with the outside world. Because remember, Karen is heavily involved with gambling and in the event of maybe a rider contacting someone on the outside world and telling them they fixed the race or something like that, there could be a lot of money to be won and also lost. So for this reason, smartphones, iPads, anything like that are actually not allowed inside of the facility. We had to hand ours in when we entered and the riders through there, well, they just simply have newspapers, magazines, books, and also a good off fashioned conversation with someone else if they want to have a talk. I can't imagine what it's like to be in there actually for six days non-stop because they don't even have their own rooms. It's simply putting something down on the floor and sleeping on top of it. So I guess all you've got to hope is that someone's not allowed snore or something like that. It is quite odd, I'm sure you'd agree, that actually to be in such close proximity to other people, you know, your enemy in fact, once you're out on the track, could be sleeping literally right next to you. So the gentleman behind me, just got out of shot actually, he's got himself a great little stall here because not only is he selling nutrition and such like for riders, but also spare parts. A tire inside of here. So remember, Soyo is one of the NJS approved tires. And like I say, if you make contact or you crash, you actually have to put a brand new tire on your bike. One of these, 10,000 yen. So yeah, they are fairly expensive, but ultimately it's your safety, isn't it? You've got to think about People outside of Japan will search long, high, low, whatever, to try and find one of these. Fantastic. So I've just realized actually what's going on here. Now, each rider has their own account, if you like, so a tab, so that they come along and they get their product. So a guy has, a guy has actually just come along and got himself a new tire. Unfortunately, he had a crash outside. He's got his bit of paper. He's filled in what he's taken. He doesn't have to pay there and then. Instead, you can pay at the end of the event. So essentially, I guess if you've got a lot of prize money, you could take it from that, or alternatively, you just settle your bill at the end of your stay here. It is everything you would need for a three night or six night accommodation at a caring race, I guess.
So I'm almost stood on the hallowed turf, if you like, the actual velodrome itself. Now, it's not like one which anybody, I'm sure, at home is regularly used to seeing. So in that it's not Siberian pine wood, which most indoor velodromes are built out of. And then outdoor velodromes, well, we normally either use concrete or asphalt. This, though, is something slightly different. It's got more of a really rough, textured, gritty kind of feel to it. What does that mean though? Well, it means that the tires, they are gonna stick a little bit better to it, but importantly, especially for caring, is that they can race in the rain. That's right, racing in the rain, which is something totally unheard of in the UK for sure. And also, I've not heard of any other outdoor velodromes having racing take part in them when it's wet, because quite frankly, it's horrific when it starts raining and you're stuck on an outdoor velodrome. But yeah, as we know, it is heavily reliant upon spectators or more, more so even people placing bets, hence the reason why it happens in the rain. Now the banking isn't super steep, it is fairly steep, but super interesting is the fact that the width of the track is absolutely massive. It's probably 50% wider than most tracks I can think of. Maybe Moscow in Russia, that's a wide old track, so it's very fast for the sprinters. But there is also a big runoff on the inside there too, because remember, riders, yeah, they could get themselves in a little bit of trouble if they do some infringement, so breaking the rules, for instance. I'm not actually sure what you'd have to do though to get disqualified, because there's quite a bit of rough, tough headbutts, that kind of thing going on. But another little fact then about that track, each corner has a number. This one's number one, because this one is the first bend after the start stroke finish line. And then when you exit that big bend, that's bend number two, three, four, respectively. And on each bend, there is a judge, for better words, who either waves a white flag at the end of the race or a red flag. Red flag obviously means that they've seen something they don't think is quite fair and an investigation needs to take place, but a white flag and everything's good. Something which I've spotted here is in fact three wind socks, as well as a little wind meter. I don't know the technical name for that, but it spins around and it lets the punters inside who are busy betting know the wind speed in meters per second. That will help them, I guess, place bets on a rider who's particularly good in crosswinds, headwinds, maybe even tailwind, I don't know. But I've never seen it at a velodrome before because, well, normally we watch cycling on a velodrome indoors, don't we? But this is so interesting. I'm learning so much during this visit. So it's six minutes past 11 on the dot and the riders are just about to start the first race of the day here. So excuse me, I'm so excited to see this. The first Japanese carrying race I've ever seen. I'd just like to quickly thank Aya for showing me around the velodrome today. It's been absolutely amazing. And also Yuma for doing all of the translation work so that I could fully understand what's going on. It has been absolutely incredible to have such close access to the riders, as well as all of the equipment that's being used. And not to mention literally a velodrome tour where we were going through tunnels and such like. I never thought I'd be able to see that ever. Uh, let me know though what you think of the caring. I think it's absolutely amazing. Let me know down there in the comments section below. Also, make sure you give it a big thumbs up and share it with anyone who loves track cycling. Don't forget to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com where we have a whole heap of goodies for you to check out. And now for another great video, click just down here. And while me, this is going to be a really sad farewell to this super velodrome and the caring. <laughs>